Our story today takes us to Tennessee, where a Tennessee law that proposed to regulate and ban in some instances drag and cabaret performance has been struck down as too broad and too vague. So this is an issue that many jurisdictions are looking at, of course, when it comes to these issues, particularly as it relates to school children, as it relates to areas of the public where children might be present, but also some states, of course, have gone further than that in their proposals or in their laws and are stretching into First Amendment protected domains. So Tennessee's law has been at least temporarily struck down for being too broad and too vague. So let's learn a little bit more about Tennessee's efforts in this domain and what the judge thinks about this issue. Let's get started with this. The United States District Judge, who was appointed by Donald Trump, writes that the law is unconstitutionally vague and overbroad, which would encourage discriminatory enforcement. So some of that, of course, is a problem. Now, when we get into the idea of unconstitutionally vague, when we're talking about a criminal law, we need to make sure that the law is at least understandable, and not every law needs to be incredibly strictly defined, but we need to know what's going on. So there's a difference between vague, which every law might be to at least some degree, because otherwise we wouldn't need lawyers to figure out where the boundaries are. But there's a difference between vague and unconstitutionally vague, where we don't really have an idea of what's going on. So the law itself, he says, is unclear in terms of what it does or does not ban. So that's a problem. He then also says it's overbroad. It covers too much stuff, which maybe that's a problem, particularly when it comes to the First Amendment domain. We have to be concerned about regulating speech as it relates to these issues. There are, of course, lawful regulations of First Amendment speech, time, place, manner being perhaps most notable. But when it comes to a subject matter or viewpoint matter discrimination, we sometimes elevate those standards depending on exactly what we're talking about. And then the idea of discriminatory enforcement, that this would be unequally applied. So some of those are some of the issues that are highlighted by this judge. The judge writing, there is no question that obscenity is not protected by the First Amendment, but there's a difference between material that's obscene in the vernacular and material that's obscene in the law. Yes. When we're talking about obscenity, and we're talking about that level, we're talking about the Miller test, which is a old test that basically looks to whether or not it appeals to the purient interest, which is actually a legal term in that case, among other factors, and also is devoid of scientific, artistic, or literary merit. So finding something to be legally obscene is actually quite difficult. And just because it appeals to the salacious, doesn't necessarily make it legally obscene. There is, of course, a difference to be had there. And courts, at least increasingly, seem to be very, very reluctant to find things to be legally obscene. So it's pretty hard to trigger that as law has developed. The judge writes that simply to it, no majority of the Supreme Court has held that sexually explicit, but not obscene speech, receives less protection than political, artistic, or scientific speech. Well, that's not exactly true. The relevant law does regulate speech as it relates to the salacious. The most obvious example being adult clubs or stores which sell adult items. We all know exactly what we're talking about, right? So can we regulate those kinds of businesses? Yes, we can. Can we ban them outright? No, the law doesn't support that. But we can regulate where they can be in town. We can do zoning regulations as it relates to them, and we can make sure that they're not too close to schools or parks or other things like that. That's fine. We can inhibit, we can regulate their hours of operation. We can regulate who is allowed into the, to the establishment. So you have to be, for example, 18 or 21 or something like that. Those kinds of laws tend to be upheld. And we can also regulate what else goes on in the business in terms of what kind of material is allowed. Some states allow, for example, people to be fully in their uh, birthday suit. Some states regulate what sort of clothing is the minimum when it comes to such places. And those kinds of regulations tend to be upheld. And also, of course, they would extend into other domains, right? What you can do in this club in terms of that is not what you can do just in public in general. So it's not quite accurate to say that the law doesn't support regulating the speech which appeals 
to the salacious, but is not legally obscene. That is not quite correct. So the judge, I think, is mistaken on that domain. The relevant law would have banned adult cabaret performances from public property or anywhere minors might be present, which that sounds roughly okay, depending on how we're doing exactly the domain. So public property, we're thinking property owned by the government. That's probably fine because the government gets to control its own property sort of the same way any landowner is. It's not quite perfect because public property is open to the public, but because it's the government's property, they do have the ability to regulate things like in sort of attire and, and dress and things like that because it's their property. So they have similar, although lesser rights to a private, a private owner of private property. So to the extent it's their own property, they do have the ability to regulate this, at least to some domain. And also where minors might be present. Again, when we're talking about these kinds of adult businesses, where minors might be present is something that the government probably has the ability to regulate. People who break the law could be charged with a misdemeanor or felony for repeated offenses. The judge used the example of a female performer wearing an Elvis Presley costume and mimicking the musician who could be at risk under the law because they might be considered a male impersonator. So. Okay, perhaps so. That might be a problem, but that sounds a little bit more like an as-applied challenge than a facial challenge. So the judge striking down the law completely seems a little bit overbroad in sort of a legal determination. A Memphis-based LGBTQ plus theater company filed a complaint in March saying the law would negatively impact them because it, they produce drag-centric performances, comedy sketches, and plays with no age restrictions, which might to some degree be the problem. When it comes to these businesses, again, how we define such things is problematic in sort of what is salacious or what is pornographic. There's always the old quote of, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. So maybe that's true. And maybe we do have some idea what we're talking about. So maybe this is an issue of someone doth protesting a little bit too much, but this judge thinks that the law perhaps could be written a little bit cleaner. So perhaps the theater company is saying this is a win that represents triumph over hate. Is that the issue, hate? Or is it the issue that we're dealing with sexualized contact as it relates to minors, which governments have long had the ability to regulate in sort of what is permitted and what is not permitted when it comes to minors in sort of this domain? So there's not exactly, this isn't exactly new when it comes to minors, perhaps a slightly new context, perhaps it's broader, but the underlying idea is something we've been dealing with for a long time. The group says that similar to countless battles between LGBTQ community, our collective success relies on everyone speaking out and taking a stand against bigotry. Yes, you know, when all else fails, just to claim your opponents are homophobic or bigots, that helps to really shut down any sort of nuanced consideration or debate. It must be that they're bigots. It must be that they're homophobic. Or maybe it's that they're a little bit concerned about the sexualized conduct when it comes to minors, which is exactly, not exactly a new concern for the American experience. Other countries in the world less concerned about this. America perhaps a little bit more concerned about a little bit more Puritan in this domain than a lot of other countries, which don't seem to mind as much when it comes to sexualized conduct in the minors. Well, America perhaps a little bit more Puritan in this domain, but that's our experience for whatever value it has. So perhaps other countries in the world, not so much, but America, yeah, this is something we've dealt with for a long time. This is not exactly new. The state's Senate majority leader said they were disappointed in the ruling, saying, quote, sadly, this ruling is a victory for those who support exposing children to the entertainment, which is of a salacious nature, adding that they hope the state's attorney general will appeal the perplexing ruling. Yeah, I think that there will be appeals on this issue for sure as we try to define some of these issues a little bit more clearly as it relates to the law. The Tennessee Republican-dominated legislature advanced the law earlier this year, with several GOP members pointing to the performances in hometowns as reason why it was necessary to restrict the performances from taking place in public or where children can view them, which that sounds generally legal. And we'd have, we could look to the details, obviously, right? Because the devil is always in the detail. But the general idea seems legal. Maybe Tennessee's specific imp implementation was a bit problematic, but the general idea is something that's been long upheld by courts in every jurisdiction in the United States. Obviously, again, the details matter. 
just because it ne just because it appeals to the salacious doesn't necessarily give the government the ability to just regulate it any way they want. The details when it comes to law, as always, are important, but the generalized idea is something that is not new. The word drag itself doesn't appear in the statute. Instead, lawmakers change the state definition of an adult cabaret to mean adult-oriented performances that are harmful to minors. You know, what is, that's a little bit problematic. We could probably do a little bit better than that. Furthermore, male or female impersonators were classified as a form of adult cabaret akin to people who take off their clothes. Which, is that legal? Is that not legal? Are we stretching too far? Are we, as we approach, you know, this is a bit of a continuum when it comes to these issues. As we approach the obscene, right, the obscene is the, is the ultimate boundary line. When we, when we hit the obscene, the state can just ban it completely, right? When we hit the true obscene, that is not protected by the First Amendment. So obscenity is the outer marker. Right. If you hit this line or go past it, you can just ban it outright. As we approach the obscene, however, the state's ability to regulate it in a way that's not a complete ban gets more and more protected because we're getting closer and closer to the line. Right. So the state's interest in regulating the content becomes more and more pronounced as we get closer and closer to the obscene. So one might ask the question where are we on this continuum? And are we sweeping in too much conduct by this? But that is in the details of the law and how the regulations are put in place. The governor quickly signed off the statute and was set to take place April 1st. However, the date has never been enforced because the federal judge sided with the group and temporarily enjoined the law from going into effect because the judge feels it's overbroad, which perhaps it is. Because again, when it comes to First Amendment protected speech, we have to be very careful in how we are regulating this and how we're writing laws around this. Because if we're sweeping in speech that is more protected than the regulations that we're putting in place, we have a First Amendment problem. It's something that has to be done extremely carefully to keep in place with the relevant law and case law that is developed. The drag law that's in place now represents the second major proposal that has targeted the LGBTQ plus people that has been passed by Tennessee. The governor has signed into law a GOP-backed legislation, which has also banned most care relating to children because the puberty blockers and the surgeries and all the rest of it. And then, of course, is being challenged in court as well, although that is less susceptible to challenge because obviously when it comes to medicine, we don't have the same First Amendment concern because it's not speech, right? It's medicine and state's ability to regulate medical practice is typically more protectable by the state in sort of what the state can and cannot do because the state has long had the ability to regulate medicine. So those cases also being challenged but not subject to the same considerations when it comes to the drag shows because of obvious First Amendment considerations that only apply in the drag show related domains. Thus, that brings us to the end of the story for the moment about the Tennessee anti-drag law, which one judge has looked at and put it in place a temporary injunction. I'm not sure I fully agree with the judge's reasoning on this case and the judge's statement that the law doesn't appear to support regulation other than the obscene does not, to my mind, appear to be a true statement of law. Obscenity would allow the state to ban it outright. That much is clear. But the relevant law when it comes to adult shows, adult theaters, adult stores, in terms of regulation, it does seem to be the truth that the state has the ability to regulate where, when, and how, including by banning minors. And to the extent this is occurring in the open and in the public, obviously the state would seem to have a broader interest. And to the extent it's happening on governmental property, even a broader interest still. So it doesn't appear to be true that the state doesn't have the ability to regulate this or even prohibit it in certain places or at certain time, given the relevant law. So I'm not sure I agree with the judge's reasoning, but that will have to be teased out in the details where everything, of course, comes to a more interesting domain. And this will also be, of course, challenge and appeal. And regardless of what the courts relating to this particular law do, this exact issue will, of course, continue to percolate up in other jurisdictions, in other courts, and in other circuits, leading, I'm sure, to an inevitable circuit conflict 
that one day the Supreme Court will have to resolve at least one way or another. But for the moment, that brings us to the end of the discussion of this case.